All right. Who watched the Super Bowl? What do you all think? I actually thought it was quite entertaining. Like from the second quarter onward. Yeah. Isn't it funny that we sit on our couches, stuff our faces, and judge these athletes, and we're like, oh my gosh, you couldn't have caught that? Seriously? (laughs) I know you all are way younger than I am, but I still think that. I'm like, how did you miss that? It's like, Dad, because there's like a 280-pound guy coming at him, screaming, probably swearing at him, like, I'm going to kill you. And he got a little freaked out, and he dropped the ball. I'm like, yeah. But he does get paid millions to catch it. All right. Entertaining? Do you guys like the halftime show? How many times did you guys, uh, did anybody do a tally on Taylor Swift sightings? Nine? Oh, no, it was way more than nine. 1113, like 1113? Oh. 11 to, th- oh, so we're doing a range here. I love that, plus or minus, like that. How many did you guys count? Nine? I'm sorry, I have to disagree. It was way more than nine, according to my youngest daughter. I think they counted up, it was like 58 seconds. Oh, so we actual time. 58 seconds, so in Super Bowl land, that's worth like $28 million of time, of air, right, whatever, or something like that. That's amazing. Didn't she play in, uh, she had a concert in Japan, was that what it was, and she had to fly here? I mean, I've had tight connections, but nether, ne- nothing like that, right? Yeah. Pretty, pretty incredible. All right. <clears throat> I think my daughter counted 14 sightings, but I'll have, to, I'll have to tell her it was 11 to 13, or someone said 9. Some of you don't care. How many don't care? Okay, fair, fair, fair. We got to... Ask the survey across the room to capture everybody's interests. But I think everybody is interested in this question. Why do most fish live in salt water? Why do most fish live in salt water? Because they're allergic to pepper. You have to remember, some of these are written by my kids. What is the name of the flower you find between your nose and your chin? The name of the flower. Two lips. lips. Nice, nicely done. I love it. Wow, someone was very with gusto over there. That might have made it on the recording, even though you weren't mic'd. Okay, this one, um, when my youngest that I was telling you about, I don't even need my glasses to, because I actually have this one memorized. It's one of my favorites. She was five, now she's 15, Um, and uh, yeah, she is a a T-Swift fan, like big time, so that's why I was the one counting with the number of sightings. We didn't think to do like a stopwatch, that was good. When she was five, she she wrote this question, or this this, um, uh, joke, Uh, what is Darth Vader's favorite dessert? Nicely done, yeah. She gave me that one or she read it somewhere, but that's, that's what I got for you today. All right. Let's talk about the exam real quick. Um, <clears throat> do you guys remember this part of my pre-exam speech? Write your name on your Scantron. Put your version number on your Scantron, like V1, V2. Do you all remember that? And then on your test packet, put your name, because that also tells us which version you have. Then there were two piles up here. You you all remember that? Two piles. Make sure you get it in the right pile. If you don't, um, no, ask ask one of the TAs, right? What did I promise you if you turned it into the wrong pile? Do you remember? No, you don't get an automatic A, no. What did I promise? You'll probably get, you'll get it graded with the wrong key and you'll probably score really poorly. Do you remember that part? So I, unfortunately, that happened to a few of you. And I think it might have happened to more that we don't know of. So we've got to manually reconcile your test packets to your Scantrons. 
So it's taking a little time. And the university was closed for three days last week, or two and a half, or whatever it ended up being. I'm not here on Friday, so. I don't, what did we do Friday? Was it just a delayed start? Delayed start, okay. We, we only are together Monday and Wednesday, so I, Friday I'm not worried about what happens here. Um, so we're working on it. Um, your, your grades are posted. Is it clear that your, your, your exam grade is your exam one total, which is exam one plus your bonus assignment one? So you should see kind of three columns next to each other. You should see bonus opportunity or bonus assignment number one, exam one score, so you can see how you did on both of those. Eventually, I have to get rid of those columns so that they will disappear, but I want you to be able to see all the information. And this week, when we get everything reconciled, those two columns will disappear. I'm hoping they don't disappear forever, but Canvas is kind of weird like that. And then your total exam score is going to be your bonus opportunity plus your exam one total, which is the column that will stay. And then all the calculations on Canvas will line up. Right now, they're a little wonky, OK? Because you actually have like three columns for exam one. That help? I know some of you are probably like super nervous, like what is happening to my grade right now? So that's how the bonus opportunity won't count against you and won't be worth technically any points. It's only bonus points because that column will go away and we've added those points to your exam one actual score. Does that make sense? Okay, it's kind of a little bit of a workaround. Honestly, how many of you watched lecture the first lecture. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. If you look at the schedule, we're going to be doing that again the week before spring break because I'm going to be out of country. Okay, I'm gone. So you're going to have the same kind of setup for the two Monday, the Monday, Wednesday before spring break. And then obviously spring break, we have it off. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. So that's what we're doing. And I had this planned a long time ago. So um, get familiar with the YouTube. If you're just coming to class and watching lectures and not watching the YouTube, we canceled class on Wednesday of last week. We didn't cancel the material of the lecture because it's on YouTube. And I sent out at least two announcements, messages of where to find that. And we're going to pick up right where that lecture left off. Okay, so if you're finding yourself a little behind, then just watch lecture one on YouTube. Okay, and then it'll, it'll kind of fill in the blanks. You, you all with me? Awesome. So this is where we need to start. Any, any other housekeeping questions before we get going? No quiz assignments this week. Did y'all see that? So next week, you'll have quiz assignments. No quiz assignments this week. How's lab going? What are you guys talking about in lab this week? Skin? So this is where they kind of like, they'll do, the classes will do this. They'll kind of move apart and then come back together. One kind of is in front, the other one's behind. <clears throat> Here's where things are a little reconciled. So in the lecture, uh, and I, I watched it to, to see how, you know, what I was talking about, what goofy stories I was telling, make sure I wasn't telling the same jokes. Uh, and most importantly, not wearing the same tie, because that would have been awkward. So I actually uh, backed up a little bit. So we're going to start here with this slide and this information, and then we're going to continue through today's lecture, picking it up from right here. All right? So we're talking about skin. We're talking about the integument, the largest organ in the body. We were discussing in the last lecture the differences between these different sweat glands. And these are accessory structures that you find in the skin. The most common are the merocrine. And these merocrine sweat glands are very abundant and plentiful on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, as well as the forehead. And, and all of you know, like, some of you are, are, you know, you get sweaty hands when you get nervous. Others, uh, your head sweaters, right? So you're kind of wiping your, your forehead when, when you get nervous or when you're exercising. Um, some of you know that your feet sweat quite a bit, right? And your roommates are always telling you, can you please leave your shoes outside, 
right? So it's just the distribution of sweat glands and the relative productivity of those sweat glands in those locations. Now, the sweat is filtered blood. If you remember from this last lecture, we talked about this hypodermis and the vasculature that dives into the dermal layer. And remember, the hypodermis is not considered part of the skin, right? It's two layers of skin, epidermis and dermis. And then beneath that, or deep to the dermis, is the hypodermis, which is mostly fat or adipose tissue and vasculature. The vasculature dives into the dermis, and the, the blood filtrate that goes through a sweat gland is what makes sweat. So you're going to have secretions that happen on the apical side of those cells and sweat glands. You're going to actually have innovation, innervation where you have nerves. So you can get nervous or your heart rate can go up. You can get excited or enthusiastic and start a sweat response. Um, the excretions that happen in sweat, there is waste products that are found there. Uh, and all of us know that the sweat that takes place with uh, these American glands, also known as eccrine glands, will sit on the surface of the skin. And there are fats and proteins um, that are made up or consist in that sweat. And all of us have a microbiome or bacteria that naturally lives on our skin. And that bacteria actually feeds on those secretions from your sweat. And that creates a byproduct of an odor. And that's body odor. So it's actually the bacteria's fault, not necessarily your sweat that smells. Okay? So that's why we wash with soap. We wash our clothes with soap because those soaps break down the membranes of the bacteria and lyse them. All right, further on, <clears throat> we talk about apocrine and modified. Apocrine glands are found in the armpits or the axillary regions, the growing, around the anus, around the areolar or the nipple. In males or mature males, it's found, they're found in the bearded areas uh, of the face. They're larger types of eccrine glands. And the ducts um, from the sweat glands release products directly onto hair follicles. And this sweat has the fatty acids and the proteins that I described. The bacteria live there, break down, just like we talked about with Merocrine. And your own bacterial fingerprint, if you will, is unique to you. Right? Your microbiome of your skin is like a fingerprint where no two individuals have the same microbiome, have the same bioflora. Therefore, the odor that's being created is unique to you. So case in point, how many of you have a pet, like a dog, a family dog? That dog knows who you are before you walk through the door. They know it's you before they see you, before they hear you, because they can smell you. And you all know, because it's embarrassing sometimes, when new people come over, and your dog's like, wow, this person's new. I'm going to really get my nose into this person and figure out who they are, right? Because those apricot glands that are closest to your dog, right, in the growing area, which is awkward. I mean, if we walked around with their armpits a little lower, they may not grab us in the growing. They might poke their nose in our armpits to find out who we are. So they're literally just trying to figure out, do I know you? Do I not know you? And, you know, there's data that demonstrates that dogs can actually smell their owners blocks away before they actually get home, which is kind of crazy. The wind might be blowing. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's not a very, maybe only convertible, only convertibles. I don't know. I feel like my car is pretty airtight. I don't know how my dog would smell me, but question. Cats have a great sense of smell. I just don't know if they care as much that their owners are home. 
<laughs> oh, it's you again. Huh. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, most, most mammals have a more keen sense of smell than, than we do, um, but the family dog is kind of like the obvious one, right? Especially with smelling strangers or smelling new people or even smelling you, right? They know that it's you. Modified sweat glands. We have two that we're going to talk about, mammary glands and ceruminous. The mammary glands um, found in the breast tissue are modified sweat glands. So instead of filtering blood uh, to make sweat, you filter blood to make milk. All right? That's where it comes from. So the food that the mother eats, the liquid that the mother consumes is into the digestive system. It's absorbed into the bloodstream, and then it's manufactured into milk by a filtration process. So there are certain foods that breastfeeding mothers will try to avoid if they're too strong for the infant. So you've heard of things like, you know, the infant won't, won't feed very well, so the lactation consultant might tell the, the, the mother who's, who's nursing, uh, let's, let's do a diet journal. Let's find out what you're eating. Maybe it's spice, overly spicy foods or strong flavors like high in garlic. Uh, we'll talk about this at the end of the semester. We talk about um, uh, the sense of taste, the special sense of taste. But your taste buds uh, when you're younger are far more sensitive they, than they are as you age. They sort of dull as you get older. So that's why when you're a kid, there are certain foods that you can't stand. And now you're like, huh, maybe I'll try Brussels sprouts. And they're not, I guess they're not that bad. I don't know why I thought they were so bad. Or maybe you hated garlic, right? So this concept of acquired taste. So in infants, spicy, garlicky, strong flavors can be repulsive to the, to the infant and they may not feed. And so the, the lactation consultant may say, let's just do a diet journal. Let's see what you're, you're having. Let's see if we can cut some things out and see if, if your baby might actually stick around and latch on a little longer and actually have a better meal, have a better feeding experience. So modified sweat glands. Another interesting fact, and these cases have been documented in the medical literature, but um, is it possible to physiologically sweat blood? Some of you are nodding your head. I told you, where does it come from? The blood, it's filtered blood, right? Sweat. So if, you, if you're under extreme sympathetic stimulation, um, high stress, corticosteroid release that circulate in the bloodstream, those glands could actually rupture and you could actually have blood coming out of pores, okay, under certain virus st states as well, certain kind of viruses that you'll study in the future. Pretty crazy stuff. Okay, another modified sweat gland, the ceruminous glands. Ceruminous, like sir ru -minous is how you pronounce that. These secrete wax in the auditory canal or the ear canal. Trap bacteria, trap dust and debris, keeping it away from the eardrum. All right, this is why we clean out our ears, but they tell you never put anything, you know, smaller diameter than your finger, right, in your, in your ear canal. Um, Q-tips, which are a brand of a, of a cotton swab that you clean your ears out. A lot of uh, dangerous things happen with those when people go too far. Uh, but the ceruminous glands of the uh, uh, ear canal are protecting that eardrum in the auditory pathway. But they are a modified uh, sweat gland. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about this last one, sebaceous glands. Uh, sebaceous glands are a little different than just pure sweat glands that we have described. Sebaceous glands... An example is a uh, holocon gland uh, that excrete broken down cells. So you can see the American uh, gland on the left, the holocon gland on, on the right. The American gland, eccrine gland that we were talking about, a sweat gland, is releasing from the apical side via exocytosis. So these, these vesicles are fusing with the, the membrane on the apical side and dumping their contents and then it secretes it out onto the surface. This is how you sweat on your forearm or your head or your you know, uh, bottom of your feet or the palms of your hand. 
The holocon glands actually are uh, cells that break down and dump their contents. So they are oil producing glands, like of the scalp. They produce a substance known as sebum, which is a waterproofing agent for the hair and for the skin. In, in humans, in us, they're found in the greatest abundance on the face and the scalp, although they're found throughout um, many different skin sites, except the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. In eyelids, we have a modified uh, meiboian gland, M-E-I-B-O-M-I-A-N, which is a special type of sebaceous gland that actually releases sebum into the tears. So you actually lubricate the surface of the eye every time you blink to protect that mucosal membrane. Um, <clears throat> face and scalp. So there are uh, a lot of problems associated, especially during puberty, with acne that primarily targets these sebaceous glands. And they will get uh, kind of plugged up or trapped with a bacterium. And then a little infection will happen. And so the macrophages will come and fight the infection, generating debris, which is a white colored substance that is dead cellular debris or dead bacterial debris, forming it under a capsule underneath the skin because it's an inflammatory process, it gets really red, except for the very center where all of that white debris is located. And then if you squeeze it, right, you pop the, the zit, and that's acne, okay? So that's why for extreme medical cases of acne, we'll prescribe uh, an, an antibiotic, a, a, a combat agent to break down the bacteria so you don't have those infections in the sebaceous glands. Questions or comments before we switch gears into um, some other conditions of the skin. So in the last lecture, we kind of talked about the different strata of the skin, uh, how it's organized, um, why it's set up that way, levels, the stratum basale layer, all the way superficial to the stratum corneum. And that's what's captured on lecture number one, if you haven't seen it yet. And now we're kind of diving into, after we've left these accessory uh, structures, now we're going to get clinical. And there's going to be some stuff later in the lecture that is a little graphic um, from a clinical standpoint, but judging by the audience, you should all start getting used to seeing challenging imagery because you're going to be seeing that clinically. Okay, so we're going to see some wounds that we'll talk about here. So conditions that we're going to talk about next, and then we'll talk about burns, and then we'll talk about healing, burns of the skin and healing. So there's uh, six specific common re uh, skin-related conditions that I want to cover, right? And again, Hopefully you all believe me after, after the, the first exam, but um, you know, I say that I'm not going to test you on something that I don't lecture on. And, and so I hope, I hope that you see that to be true and you have some level of confidence that if you're studying, if, if you're coming to lecture, you're reviewing your lecture notes, reviewing the lectures if you so choose on YouTube um, and trying to maybe ascertain like what are some questions that could be in a multiple choice format that I might ask, here's a great opportunity, you know, to see just on definitions. Do you know what these are? So let's go through them. So erythema. Erythema comes from the, uh, the Greek root uh, uh, erythros, which means red or redness of the skin. So erythema just means redness of the skin. You would see erythema uh, on somebody that was flush in the face, somebody that was overheated, uh, somebody that was embarrassed, somebody that was um, running a fever. These would all be you know, clinical situations where you would see erythema. Or if you had a wound that was red in color, kind of like that acne example where you know that there's a red mound and then a white dot or a white center. So that redness is giving you an indication that there is inflammation 
or a higher level of uh, perfusion of blood. Jaundice. Jaundice is a yellowish pigmentation of the skin. It also can manifest itself in the conjunctive uh, surfaces of the eye. The whites of the eye become more yellow. Uh, so jaundice is a situation where you have hyperbilirumia in the patient. So bilirubin is a byproduct of red blood cell recycling. So red blood cells in the body last a few months, about three to four months, and then they are recycled. Right? So they're first born or first manufactured with a nucleus, and then they expel their nucleus, and that's why they become very narrow, and they're anuclear as they circulate around the body. But after a period of time of binding oxygen and releasing oxygen, they sort of wear out, and you have to recycle them. So you recycle them, and a big organ that's responsible for that's the liver. And <clears throat> the liver will cycle part of the bilirubin and excrete it into uh, the large intestine. And the heme group, which is the iron-containing component, which is oxidized as a reddish-brown, like a dark red-brown color, kind of like dark rust. And that excreted in your large intestine is what gives stool the color that it is. Otherwise, it would be probably more like a grayish color. Okay? So if the liver isn't functioning correctly or is compromised or not online yet, uh, you would actually have too much bilirubin circulating in the bloodstream. It's going to deposit itself in the skin and the whites of the eye, and you're going to see that yellowish tint. And so that's called jaundice of the skin. It's a clear clinical sign that something's not right with the liver. <coughs> Excuse me. Two categories of patients that we typically see this problem with. One is, any guesses? Infants, newborns, premature, premature babies. Very good. The other population, very different population, but alcoholics, okay? That ruins the liver. They have a cirrhotic liver. It's not working correctly. With the preemies, uh, it's a relatively easy fix. We use light therapy. You can shine certain wavelengths of light at the skin, put it over their crib or their bassinet. They look like they're in a sun tanning booth. <clears throat> and you can actually break down the bilirubin in the skin that way. It doesn't work as well for um, alcoholics. Because the infant is premature, so the liver isn't really operational yet, but in the next week or two it will be. With a chronic alcoholic that has cirrhotic liver, the liver is actually dying. It's not coming online, and you're waiting for it. You're actually, you've actually destroyed it. Okay, pallor. Pallor just is pale color of mucous membranes or skin. You'll see this in uh, anemia. You'll see this in patients with shock. It's usually due to a reduced amount of blood flow to the skin. Albinism. This is a genetic condition. This individual in the uh, sort of upper left, this comes from the Latin word albus, which means white. Um, albinism is the lack of melanocytes producing melanin that gives skin its pigment. And <clears throat> it's a pretty rare disease or disorder, but it is a congenital disorder or defect. Um, you also see the absence of pigment in hair as well because that's, you know, a combination. That's an accessory structure of the skin. Um, and the melanin uh, the problem is you, you have an amino acid known as ty uh, tyrosine, which is converted to melanin, and these individuals lack the enzyme that converts tyrosine to melanin. And so that's why they don't actually have this coloration. Hematoma, this lower left picture, right? This individual's got their pants down at their ankles is what you're looking at, and that's basically their right thigh 
and all the way down. It's a bruise. All of you have had a bruise. Maybe not that bad, hopefully. But a hematoma is a localized collection of blood outside of the vasculature. Where you've ruptured the vasculature, the blood leaves, and it collects extra vasculature or extra vesicular outside of the vessel, and it clots. And as it breaks down, it changes colors, right? Initially, it might be red, and then it goes purple, um, and then it starts getting you know, yellow and weird colors of green. As you're breaking down the red blood cells in that tissue. Um, <clears throat> hemangioma. Anybody know who the person is in the upper right? It's a young audience, but I'm just kind of curious. None? So this is a port wine stain of this individual where you have a collection of vasculature that is in a overproduced growth mode during development embryologically. And so we, we, we call them, you know, birthmarks or uh, angel kisses or, you know, there's all sorts of different things that we, we try to refer to these as. That's a hemangioma, uh, where it, all it really is is just an overabundance of vasculature underneath the skin. And so this individual is Miguel Gorbachev. So Miguel Gorbachev was um, the uh, former uh, leader of the Soviet Union in the, in the 80s. And uh, he was sort of this well-recognized individual, uh, kind of a world leader during the Cold War, and had this hemangioma. They, they can be removed most of the time. Uh, he chose not to, didn't bother him. Uh, and and how, would you, how would you remove them? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about tattoos here in a second. Uh, it's very similar to tattoo removal, where you actually shoot energy at, and, uh, at, at the lesion or the tissue location and using heat vaporize that, that location. Um, may cause some scarring, so a lot of individuals choose not to do it. Okay. Same thing with moles, right? Now, some of you are like, well, I know, but like my mom or my dad had a mole removed, and the dermatologist said it was really important to do that. Well, if the mole becomes irregular, we're going to talk about that in a second, uh, then it has maybe changed its format and has become cancerous. So a mole is just an overproduction of melanin, right, in a location. It forms a brown spot. A mangioma is an overproduction of blood vessels during development, forms a reddish tone to the skin, okay? All these just different common, very, very common related uh, skin conditions. Questions? Perfect segue into the types of cancer. We're going to talk about three. It's very important that you're able to discriminate between these three different types of cancers. That's a huge hint for exam two, if you didn't catch it, right? Is skin cancer. Sounds scary, right? Skin cancer. So-and-so was diagnosed with skin cancer. Or my mom had a, had a mole and they took it out because they thought it was cancerous. Like, oh my gosh, is she going to live? It's like, yeah, she's going to be fine. Oh, okay. So like the general public doesn't have an appreciation for different types of cancers. So let's, let's get there so you can educate. A basal cell carcinoma. This is the uh, most common type of skin cancer. So three out of 10 Americans, about 30% of the population in the US will develop a basal cell carcinoma during their life. Eight out of 10 skin cancers are basal cell carcinomas. Metastasis is rare, but it can occur. That means it breaks off and it goes somewhere else or it spreads. So the relative level of risk of basal cell carcinoma, is it high or low? Low. It's not very metastatic, so it's not really going to go anywhere. So if you find it, you can cut it out, and you're probably going to be fine. Okay, you're like, wow, really? Like, what if it's on your face? Well, then you're going to have a little scar. What if it's on your arm? Well, you're going to have a little scar, but you're going to live, most likely. So basal cell carcinoma, most common 
least deadly. You with me? That's a great question. So in, in my pathology class, we go through a whole module on cancer. And in, in order for, so cancer is not contagious. Everybody understands that, right? You can't catch it from somebody. Somebody has cancer and you're sitting next to them or you go visit them, likely you're more dangerous to them if they're being treated for their cancer. Okay, and that's why everybody's got masks on. And, you know, it's like reminiscent of COVID times, but um, I, that's also important too. Like we have a cancer center here. Cancer is probably in a group this size. Cancer, unfortunately, has impacted many of you in this room. I'm guessing you all have stories. My mom passed away from cancer. Okay, about six years ago. Uh, so cancer is a mutated form of your own cell. So something has to mutate the cell to answer the question. In the skin, what are the most usual cul culprits that are going to mutate the skin? In the southwest, U UV light radiation. Okay, for, for more of the lay people, that is in layman's terms, what? Sunlight, Sunlight right? But that is absolutely correct. Right? We're going to talk about that here in a second. So this, is a, this lecture, is, the questions are moving very nicely. I should probably give you five bucks for forecasting where we're headed. Basal cell carcinoma, kind of least, uh, least deadly. Um, <clears throat> the top picture is a lesion, upper right, of a basal cell carcinoma. What layer of the skin do you think is primarily being affected on a basal cell carcinoma. The stratum basale, very good, the basal layer of the skin, right? Now that you know that, you, you see the clinical terminology, you're like, oh, I think I actually know where that cancer is. That makes sense. Okay, how about this one? Squamous cell carcinoma, the middle picture. I mean, what layers do you think this might most likely impact? Not the basal layer, because they're not squamous in appearance. Something deeper or something more superficial? Superficial, right? Something that's going to be flattened as you work your way up. Yeah, I see some people giving themselves claps. I mean, do that. Give yourself props. That's good. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Squamous cell carcinoma, second most common type of skin cancer. Secondary to basal cell, a higher risk of metastasis than basal, but a lower risk than the third one that we're going to talk about here in a second, which is melanoma. Okay? Malignant melanoma. This is the rarest. Um, it's found in skin. It's found in the colon and in the eye, believe it or not. And it is the most lethal. So often, melanocytes that make pigment are impacted in the skin, and that's where we get the melanoma terminology from. Malignant means that it typically will break off and divide and metastasize and go, something, go somewhere else. Malignant or, meta, or metastatic, those are bad words in cancer world. Okay? Benign, a benign lesion, B-E-N-I-G-N, -E benign lesion is precancerous. You caught it early enough. It's not going anywhere. That's the good kind of cancer, right? When you hear reports like so-and-so has cancer, really? They found a lesion. Uh-oh, what's going on? Well, it's benign. You're like, oh, what does that mean? Well, it was like the good kind. They cut it out and they're not worried about it. Okay, so that's how we categorize these different cancers. Make sense? The M words, metastatic, malignant, are the bad words. Benign is the safer word, if you will. Clear? So this little double helix on the bottom is to try to illustrate the question that was elegantly asked. When UV light and answered by the gentleman in the back, UV light is actually going to target these bonds at the level of the DNA and cause nicks or fragmentation to occur. And now when you replicate the next cell, you get a aberration from the copy that you had originally. And so there's other types of things in our environment that will cause these mutations, like pollutants. There could be environmental toxins or chemicals. Um, 
any type of radiation. Like, you know, people are kind of freaked out about going to the dentist and getting an x-ray. Like, am I going to start getting cancer in my jaw? Right? There's actually more radiation exposure um, to all of us by airplane travel and doing daily activities, like especially in the Southwest, than there is in going and getting an x-ray at the dentist. Okay? And a lot of dentists are starting to show those kind of charts in their dental offices to kind of put it in perspective. But saving yourself or protecting yourself from sunlight, especially here in the Southwest, is a really good idea. Okay, how many of you have a tattoo? This is a fun question. Oh, and then you have, you have an actual question, yeah. but you don't have a tattoo. Because you, your hand was up, and then, sorry to put you on the spot there. So what was your question? Then we'll go back to the tattoo folks. Uh, great question. Um, why is squamous cell carcinoma more likely to metastasize than basal cell carcinoma? It's a great question. I don't have a great answer. I don't know. Uh, it just statistically speaking, the squamous cell carcinomas tend to be a little bit more active. Um, the good news is because they're more superficial um, from a, a clinical standpoint to remove them, to surgically resect, it's, it's less traumatic. You don't have to go as deep. Um, and and any time they're going to remove cancer from any tissue, they're going to try to circumscribe the cancer, and they're going to take healthy tissue or a healthy margin around it, like in three dimensions. Let's say it's a nice ball, which cancers usually aren't. Then they're going to excise a ball that's slightly larger than where that sphere of cancer theoretically is. So if it's a squamous cell carcinoma, it is, it is a little easier to move. But why it's more metastatic, I don't know the answer to that. For whatever reason, those cells seem to react. Um, it could be, this is speculation, so don't quote me on this, and this won't be on the exam. And this is what I always try to coach my grad students on, is like, when someone asks you a question you don't know the answer to, don't BS. Just say, I don't know the answer. Then you can say, it could be, or I would speculate, this might be going on. So that's where I'm at right now, is speculating. What we do know is the stratum basali are more cuboidal-like cells. And as you move superficial, the cells, there was a student that asked me a question before class. The, the, the cells moving more superficial as they move up are further and further away from the blood supply. And so as they get to that 250 diffusion distance, they start starving of oxygen. And they realize, okay, it's, start to, it's packing up time. So they pack up their nucleus and their organs and they, ex, they get rid of them. And that's why they flatten. So they're already in sort of a, you know, last ditch effort mode. So metabolism is pretty high. And so if you have higher metabolism of a cell and then another cell, the highly metabolic cell will actually, you know, have more activity. So if it's cancerous and more metabolic, it might be more dangerous and that might be what's contributing to it being more metastatic. Does that make sense? But again, that's total speculation. AKA, I was just BSing my way through all that, okay? All right, back to the tattoo question. I'm not gonna ask you to show me your tattoo because some of them may not be like appropriate, but wh who has a tattoo? Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, um, and you got them how long ago? Two weeks ago, wow, okay, let's go. Um, <laughs> Someone's like, Thursday, when the school was shut down, I had nothing to do. Uh, how, 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 what's the oldest tattoo we have in the room? Five years ago. Five years ago. My goodness. Okay. Anybody can beat five years? Seven. Do I hear eight? Nine? Ten? Nine. Going once. Nine in the back. Going once. I know it sounds like an auction, doesn't it? Going once. Going twice. Soul, nine in the back. Okay, so <clears throat> what is going on with a tattoo, right? These are permanent ink markings. They're injected into the skin where if you had to make an educated guess, hypothesize, BS your way through it, right? Where do you think these injections might be? Epidermis or dermis? Dermis, why? 
epidermis sheds. If you're a tattoo parlor, though, and you start putting into the epidermis, you might have better business, right? They're going to come back every six to eight weeks to get the new ink, right? But you might get a lot of bad Yelp reviews. Into the dermis. Then this ink is encapsulated by your immune system, right? My five, seven, nine, even my two weaker here. <clears throat> Actually, you might be two weaker. You're, you're just, oh, two years. Oh, I thought you said two, two weeks. Sorry, sorry. I was going to ask to see it, but I was going to use this little thing right here, this Elmo, and show it to everybody. Anybody have a fresh tattoo? Really? How fresh? One week? Wow. Wait, was it before or after lecture last week? Last Friday. Oh, it's even younger than a week. Like a week plus. Okay. So is it pretty red still? No. Do you guys remember that first week, though, it flares up, gets really red, right? Very tender. Then it kind of subsides because that's that, that uh, erythema that comes on is indication that your immune system is bringing macrophages into the area. And at some level, the macrophages are going to be successful at digesting away some of the ink. But they put enough ink in there, if they know what they're doing, that they override the ability of the macrophages to remove all the ink. And then it encapsulates and becomes permanent, right? So how do you think we would... Um, uh, so here's, a, here's a kind of a schematic of a skin profile on the right, where the ink is being delivered. Now the question I have for you is, how many of you had one removed? Has anybody had one removed? Was it painful? Very painful. Okay, so you might want to close your ears, or you're welcome to take off this, like, PTSD here. But we're going to show you a tattoo removal Delivering energy into the dermis to basically vaporize that ink. Twenty years. We got a nine year in the audience, but She laughs at him. That's not very... Don't, don't laugh if you're a provider. Don't, you never want to laugh at your patients. I am going to make you watch the whole thing. Not too bad. Some of you are still with me. Here's some results of before and afters. There's a lot of clinics that are doing this. A lot of medical spas are doing this now. Okay, they'll just buy these laser machines and do tattoo removal. Okay, I think it's, a, it's probably an industry where we could make some serious improvements because there's different types of ways to deliver energy uh, to the skin. Uh, but you can kind of see the uh, immediately after, and a lot of times this stuff will fade. Uh, did yours go away pretty well, or how long ago was it that you had it removed? Still kind of there. So you can, you can go back and, and have multiple sessions to try to basically fade the ink as best you can. Okay, let's talk about burns. First, second, third degree burns, and then different types of treatments. A first degree burn involves only the epidermis. It gets very red. That word is erythema. It can be very painful, and the tissue floods with edema or fluid. Second degree burn, an epidermis in part of the dermis. You get blistering. So if you, if you hit a sunburn and no blistering, 
first degree. Sunburn and blistering, second degree. Or a stove burn, right? You touch a, a hot pot or a hot pan. <clears throat> Third degree burns is where it gets really aggressive. I mean, these are all degrees of painful, but a third degree burn involves the epidermis, the dermis uh, is completely destroyed. You often require graft transplants for the patient. Um, you're going to see a lot of fibrosis or scarring, like what we talked about in the last lecture. You'll get disfigurement that takes place. Um, IV nutrition and fluid replacement is critical because the skin provides two critical things and protections that we worry about. First one, when you have a burn, like a third degree burn, is dehydration. And what's the second one that you worry about? Infection, because dehydration is keeping the fluid in your body. Remember, 50 to 75% of our body is made up of water. And you have basically a covering around you to keep that fluid in. If it's compromised, you're losing a lot of water, water vapor loss. So the skin provides that water barrier protection. <clears throat> you also keep a lot of harmful agents out that we don't think about on a daily basis until there's some pandemic about a virus that you know too much about now, right? But there's bacteria all over the place. It colonizes your skin, right? That bacteria lives on your skin and feeds off of your sweat and the secretions that you manufacture. And that microbiome gives you your own particular fingerprint, bacterial speaking, as well as your own smell and odor um, that we talked about. So all of that goes away and that bacteria now is inside. Now the number one way to treat is a term that's a weird term, it's called debridement. It's spelled debridement, but it's pronounced debridement, D E. B-R-I-D-E-M-E-N-T. And debridement is a terminology that means removing necrotic tissue or dead tissue. And we can do this a couple of different ways. You can do this surgically, cut it away, or you can do it with um, uh, mechanical abrasion, debriding the wound. If you work in a wound clinic in the future, you'll he hear this term a lot. You can use enzymes to break down the tissue that's, that's dead or necrotic, slough it off, you can heal. There's an old um, methodology that actually has a lot of merit to it, and you've seen it in movies, and it's actually called maggot therapy. You're like, what? So it actually really works. You can debride a wound using maggots, because they'll only feed on necrotic tissue and they will leave living tissue alone. The concept is hard to get your head around, so FMC doesn't really use many maggots, but it would work, okay? I like those movies when you see stuff and you're like, is that real? Could that really happen? All right, I've got a, a video that I wanna show. melanin production and also transfer more melanin to the keratin. 
the mushroom blocker or tan if you're out in the sun for a while. But the melanin defense is far from foolproof. Regardless of how dark your skin is or how much you tan, some UV rays can shoot past. And when they do, they can damage your DNA. This can actually happen in a few different ways. Sometimes the radiation will directly block your DNA. Damaging it can just obscure it and affect it. Alternatively, UV rays can do something more sinister. They can actually turn your melanin against you. The radiation can make your cells produce these harmful molecules called free radicals. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but essentially, the free radicals excite an electron in your melanin. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to stop it there. I wanted you guys to appreciate kind of the role that sunlight plays uh, in UV radiation plays. And sort of there is a myth that if, you know, you don't really sunburn because your, you know, genetic makeup is such that you enjoy, you know, darker skin tones or you tan or you bronze, right, and you, you're, you're happy about that, you actually still can experience ultraviolet damage even though you have darker skin, okay? It's very important that you understand that concept because I feel like that is something that is misunderstood uh, in, in the general public that, okay, well, there are certain skin tones that don't have to worry about using sunscreen. That's actually not true, okay? UV protection is very important no matter how dark or how light your skin is. Uh, it may not be as painful for you, if you're out in the sun for very long, but that ultraviolet radiation is still um, potentially causing damage to your DNA. Okay. So let's talk about grafts and how the skin repairs itself. <clears throat> um, there's two main processes of repair in skin. One process is known as regeneration, and the second process is known as fibrosis. And the terms are used, unfortunately, more interchangeably. Like, people say, oh, well, your you're, you're cut healed. You had healing. Well, is it regeneration or is it, is it fibrosis? Regeneration is synonymous with wound resolution where you actually have complete functionality returning to the tissue. In the case that we're exam uh, examining here, it's skin. So if you had complete wound resolution or complete skin regeneration, you shouldn't be able to see a scar. And you should have normal function return back to the skin. What do I mean by normal function? Like if, if you had like, you know, a big old cut on your head or you had surgery on your head, and the hair didn't grow back there, and you can kind of see where the scar was, or on your arm, you see like a raised piece of tissue or a scar, the function has returned, right? That scarring is, is a different mechanical strength or, or, or stiffness. Um, the sweat glands probably aren't there. Uh, the hair cells may not be back, and, and you kind of understand the difference. If you don't see those accessory cells or know that they're there, and visibly you can see scarring, that process is not regeneration. That process is fibrosis. Fibrosis slash scarring, which is the second kind of healing that the body does. When we're younger, and then I'll get to your question. When we're younger, our skin and our organs heal better, and there's more regeneration when you're younger. As we age, those regenerative processes fade. That's part of the aging process. And so you might have cut yourself when you were like five, fallen off your skateboard, and you can't even find it like on your knee anymore. And then like two weeks ago, you slipped and fell when you were, or last week, you were you know, shoveling snow, you slipped and fell and you know, cut yourself on the snow shovel and there's like this mass monster gash in your hand and you're like, this is, and it's gonna look horrible, right? As you get older, it's even worse. So the body will try to heal by one of these mechanisms to close up the wound, no matter what. So we would rather, the body would rather have an unattractive scar, fibrosis, but have healing if it can't return function. And the way that it gives fibrosis is it produces an excessive amount of collagen in the, in the, in the tissue to close up that wound bed. There was a question over here. 
Yeah, that's, that's why you have scar tissue. So scar tissue is the body's process of healing when it can't regenerate, and it leaves scar tissue. Okay? The difference would be like, <clears throat> you know, if you, you want to hang a really heavy mirror on the wall, and there's not a, 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 a two-by-four or a stud in the wall, so you get one of those big anchors, you have three of them, and you hang your mirror, and when you move out, they tell you to patch the wall and paint. You pull your mirror off, you pull out the, the screws and the anchors, and there's these monster holes, and then you go get some spackle at Home Depot, and you put it in there, and you're like, yeah, I can still see that. Right? That's fibrosis. Regeneration would be like you actually hire a drywall specialist that can actually float right, the texture and match the texture of the wall and then paint it, and you're like, wow, I can't even see where the hole was. You understand the difference? So skin grafting. This is a very common process that's still used today where we'll take skin from one area of the body and we'll transplant it in the same patient to another area of the body to create that covering. So you can see the harvest on the left, and then we put it through an extender where we actually squeeze the tissue. You take like maybe a two by three inch piece of skin, and you stretch it to be you know, six by 10 to cover bigger areas in patients that have excessive burning. The outcome on the far right is the example that you'll see in that honeycomb appearance that happens in patients with skin grafting is because of this stretching that takes place in the middle of trying to expand the piece of tissue, the smaller piece of tissue, to cover a, a bigger area. And that's a very common image that you'll see on patients, especially of significant burns. There's a few technologies. This is one that um, I'm going to highlight because I was associated with it. This was back in the 90s. And this tissue was manufactured in the lab. We would actually take a scaffold and we would seed cells onto it. We would seed dermal fibroblasts. This is an important piece of detail to know. There might be a question about this part. What cells were they? They were not embryonic stem cells. They were dermal fibroblasts, skin fibroblasts. They were neonatal from a donor source from males only because those are the only newborn infants that readily give away or well, their parents decide to readily give away skin. Where do you think the skin came from? I heard penis. Yeah, you can say that word. It's actually a real word. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, these are foreskin fibroblasts on circumcised tissue that was typically discarded. Scientists are weird. We would collect them, and we would pull the fibroblasts out, and we would grow them in culture, and we would make a new piece of skin from penis tissue. Yes. Okay? Pretty weird, huh? But <clears throat> this is what it looked like. You had a scaffold there. That's a cell right there in the middle. That's a fibroblast growing and stretching across this scaffold. This company, we, it sold a few times, changed hands a few times um, over the years. It's still being sold today. But the clinical data that I want to show to you is in diabetic foot ulcers <clears throat> here. So this is the bottom of somebody's heel. And this study was in 95, 1995, which probably predates many of you in the room. But the inclusion criteria in the study is you had to have an open wound as a diabetic foot ulcer for six months or greater to be enrolled in the, patient, in the study. So that person had that wound there for six months. I know. They can't feel it typically because they have neuropathy, meaning they don't, they don't have like that, numb, that pinprick feeling in your, in your you know, legs when your foot goes to sleep. That's them all the time. That word's called parathesis. Uh, we put this dermograph technology on, and you can see after one week, three weeks, five weeks, ten weeks later, and every week they would put a new piece of dermograft or a new piece of tissue-engineered skin coming from neonatal fibroblasts. That's where we got the cells from. And we closed these wounds in ten, in, in ten weeks. If we looked at laser Doppler, 
uh, this is the cool colors mean no blood flow. The warmer colors, like the oranges and the reds, mean that blood is now um, flowing into that region. So you can see, like in, in one week, three weeks, and five weeks, these time points, there's in, in the area traced with the wound, there's cool colors in the middle, no blood flow. Now you're starting to get blood flow. Now you're getting a lot more blood flow. So the secret here, remember I told you when we were talking about tendons and ligaments and cartilage, one of the secrets of healing tissue is to get blood perfusion. So if you can get blood perfusion into the wound, and nowadays, some of the newer technology with wound vacs, you apply a vacuum to the wound to kind of basically pull or encourage blood vessels to grow in. And that's how wound vacs are working. So VEGF production is a angiogenic growth factor. So it stimulates blood vessels to grow. And you can see that the amount of expression of this protein goes up significantly over a 24 and 48 hour period. If we look at control tissue in the upper right versus the lower right, these areas here are all pipelines of blood vessels that are growing into the wound bed. And that's how this actually heals. Okay. All right, I got a warning for you. Did you have a question in the back? No question? Okay. I know you're eating a, a popsicle or a sucker or something, but you may not want to look. All right, so this was a patient case. You can turn away if you don't want to look. I see, that's fine. I see lots of people going up. This was a chainsaw accident. Okay, so a person was uh, cutting wood, slipped, chainsaw hit him in the uh, across the bridge of the nose and into the face, uh, was rushed to UCL, UCLA Medical Center. This is in Southern California. This company that, that I was working at was in uh, La Jolla in San Diego. And so most of our cases were there in Southern California. This is post-surgically. Um, wound was closed. Dermograph was applied. Uh, patient was treated. This is one year following. One year following. Okay, so I'm going to ask a couple questions. Do you think this patient went through regeneration or fibrosis? Okay, talk amongst yourselves. Then I'm going to ask you why. Why you say that? Who's got, who's got some input for us? Maybe both. I like this idea. Why would you say both? So the skin was able to grow and close, but there is still some evidence of scar tissue. You agree? You can still see some scarring. What about functionality? Do we get a return of functionality in certain areas? Like hair grew back, right? I mean, it's a pretty amazing outcome, but I want you to see even with, you know, amazing technology at your, at your fingertips, you're going to get some spectrum of Scarring and regeneration in your patients, okay? All right, I got one more video I want to show you all. And this will be where we, we kind of finish up for, for today, but bear with me. I think you'll find this video quite amazing, okay? Stick with me. Standard techniques that we have now, uh, that takes weeks, months, sometimes. And the reason why people die is because of these infections that develop while we're waiting for the skin to heal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that's a pretty classic example of a patient. So the way to get normal, healthy skin, as much of it as we want, with healthy skin, that's the Holy Grail of heart surgery. Do you hear a lot of things keep sounding like, what's wrong with your job? We call it the skin cell gun. Um, a device for the deposition of skin cells on the wound. It looked like something you see in Star Wars. This is Matt Hero, the safety police officer from Pennsylvania. He's one of the first people to be treated with the gun. Uh, I attended a Las Vegas party at a friend's house, and there was a small bonfire. I was standing next to the bonfire, and an individual decided to throw a cup of gasoline on the fire. The worst part was my face. It was the whole right side of my face here, uh, my ear, my neck, and my shoulder, and the entire top part of my arm. See the blistering? This photo shows what a second degree burn looks like. Because of the blistering, right? This new procedure, uh, which is a spray gun, and asked me if I would be interested. Skin cell spray is like paint spraying, just you need a more sophisticated device like computer control. We isolate cells from the healthy part of the skin, the patient's own cells, which can be taken in a water solution, and that solution. Um, is prepared for cell spraying. Basically what they were, they were doing was taking my stem cells from my skin and putting them all in the gun and spraying it on my arm. Scientists have been able to regenerate sheets of skin for decades. The problem is it takes weeks for that skin to grow. That's true. The stuff I showed you took us two plus months to make the dermograft. It takes like one and a half hours. One and a half hours. To isolate the cells and to spray the cells. This is what your own skin probably looked like before treatment. This is what it looked like four days after it was sprayed with its own stem cells. Four days. They did it on a Friday, and my follow-up was that Monday, and they burned me and said it was healed, completely healed. Though the skin gun is still experimental, 